If you've been saying for years, I want to start a business, you've been telling anybody who will listen for years now, I want to start a business, I really want to start a business, I want to start a business. But if you haven't done it, you'd be very wise to start ignoring your words and look at your actions. 2000 days is when I sold CD Baby, and I felt like I've peaked, my best is behind me, my gravestone will say he did CD Baby and nothing since. Why did you not think that was going to be many other things? I'm not the kind of person that would say, you know, hey, you put me, drop me anywhere on earth with a dog in my hand and I'll turn it to a million within a year. I'm not that guy because I don't care that much. I'm ambitious in my ideas, but not in my bank account. Hi, it's Rob Moore here. And this next disruptive guest, I must have heard six years ago on one of the biggest podcasts in the world. And I thought, this guy's answers are completely different to any answers I've heard on business, personal development mindset. I've got to get him on my show. And I tried for years and years and years and got rejection after rejection after rejection. And finally, we made this interview happen. And I think you will really feel it's worth the wait. Now, he sold his company in 2008 for 22 million, pledged to give, pretty much give it all away to the music industry and wasn't really any more concerned about the commercial element of business and life, travels around the world, doesn't do podcast interviews anymore. Uh, also did a very, very famous, huge TED talk. So make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel because I have many disruptive interviews, guests that don't do the rounds. This guy doesn't do podcasts anymore. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and enjoy this disruptive interview with a guest I heard six years ago on a huge podcast and never thought I'd be able to get. Hello, everyone. I am I'm privileged, excited, and slightly nervous, Derek. <laughs> When you said um, I am and then you paused, I thought you'd forgotten your name for a second. Yeah. You are officially, Derek, the person who has rejected me the most for an interview. That's <laughs> official. Um, I think it was five or maybe six times. And <laughs> I've pondered why I asked you so many times and didn't get the hint. Um, and I'd love to ask you straight off the bat, uh, why did you retire? Uh, what? Well, let me ask you two questions, if you don't mind, Derek. Sure. Uh, why did you reject me once, two, three, four, fives, and then why did you in, uh, accept to come on the show for the sixth time? Five or six years ago, I did an interview with Tim Ferriss, who's an old friend of mine, and I didn't realize his podcast was so famous. <laughs> so I gave my email address on the air. And over 8,000 people emailed me over the next couple months, and it became wow. a full-time job. In fact, I had to hire an assistant just to help me triage all these emails. It was a full-time, 12-hour-a-day job for a couple months just to answer the emails from that one podcast. So after that one, I said, right, I'm not going to do any podcasts for a while. That was enough. And then it's a certain mode that I get into where I have absolutely nothing on my calendar. Like I literally, like I don't have a Google calendar. I don't keep appointments. I have nothing scheduled ever um, and had nothing scheduled for five years. And it was really nice to just every day, just do my own thing. And if somebody said, Hey, could we do an interview? I would just say, nah. So I did none for five years with anybody, no matter how famous. Um, and then a few months ago, I felt ready to start doing them again. Nothing to do with the Corona stuff. It was a few months before that. Um, and so now I've just built it into my schedule and I've got this uh, camera and microphone set up so it's easy for me to just step over here and hit record and go. So that's why the, it was uh, it was nothing personal. I said no to absolutely everybody for five years. I am, um, I'd love to come back to that in a moment, Derek, but um, I that's how I found you actually. Uh, I listened to the Tim show and I was one of those 8,000 people. <laughs> yep. Um, but see, I love that. I love that uh, it was worth it to me. You know, I don't think that that was a mistake. I think it was wonderful because, oh my God, there's 8,000 people that I met because of that, including two uh, women that later became girlfriends and great loves and one that I was just talking with an hour ago. Wow. Uh, and these are all just because of random connections because I gave out my email address. So... Ooh. Uh, no regrets at all. I think it's wonderful. And let's talk about that. We've already got three loops open here. <laughs> um, but that is the magic of podcasts. That's the magic of um, people like you, Derek. And I'd like to put myself in the same category. I will reply to everybody's email that emails me. 
Yeah. Um, and I will give my email out even in a place where maybe like, oh, you might get inundated. Mm -hmm. I like meeting new people. And I think that there's some mystery and some beauty in that when everyone else is kind of doing the opposite and saying, oh, speak to my agent. Or, right. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. And, you know, you replied back. We had a dialogue. Even when you rejected me, you rejected me politely. Uh, I always remember that. And I don't know, when people reject me politely, I have to go again and again. And, you know, obviously, we, you know, it's not like we're, we're not lovers like you've met with uh, from other people on, on the Tim show, but um, you moved to England, and of course, I'm I'm really into Radiohead, and you know, we just kept a little dialogue going, and I, I yeah, no, I think that's kind of a beautiful thing that gets a bit lost at the moment. Would you say? Yeah, yeah, um, and hey, I mean, there's another lesson in that story: is that persistence is polite. I think this is a counterintuitive lesson that's hard to learn because when we're teenagers and we have a crush on somebody that doesn't have a crush back, then we learn that persistence is um, inconsiderate and thoughtless. Yeah, persistence means you're, you're dense, you're not taking a clue. But in business, persistence is polite because the alternative is to contact somebody once and if you don't get what you want, then you give up and you kind of curse them and, and you know, say bad things about them for years to come. Whereas instead, if you understand that a rejection is nothing personal at all, has nothing to do with you, it's just their current situation, well, then that's actually very thoughtful and polite of you to just politely persist. That's very true. And um, look, I, I don't take rejection that well, Derek, and you wouldn't have known that when you emailed me. <laughs> uh, but that's because when I was a child, I had a lot of rejection. But I've tried mm -hmm. to learn over the years to be more mature and grateful. Um, but one thing I want to say about podcasts, because there's a couple of things that struck me. And I think why I did just check in, you know, I think it, it'd be fair to say I didn't hound you. I just checked in every six months or or, or year or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but one, I think the interview with yourself and Tim was, it must have been a good two hours. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I felt like I really knew you from a podcast, which I know is crazy. I know that almost it's, makes me sound no, like it's a not crazy. Or something. It's reasonable. But I, yeah, I just, you know, because that is the, the intimacy of a podcast, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, I didn't know Derek before. I actually knew CD Baby, your previous company. I, I knew that, but I didn't know you. It didn't matter. I really liked, you, for me, you had some very alternative and thought-provoking ideas, like the third person is the most successful person that you think I'm not the first. And I found that really challenging to my thought process which i really liked so that stayed with me and then the second thing was your voice i i, I you have got the most i'm sorry if it's a man crush it's just i'm just i have to i'm an honest guy on the show you've got a beautiful voice i haven't i broke a, a public speaking world record six years ago i ruined my voice i have a terrible voice and you have this like beautiful deep warm voice and um, yeah, sorry, Derek. I've some no, I'm weird <laughs> um, Thank you. So yeah, that, that, that's what that podcast did. It created some. I mean, I know you had eight thousand emails, and that's not intimate. But I bet the eight thousand people, or many of them, that emailed you, have felt already a connection with you. It's probably a very intimate thing. Yeah. So that's why sometimes people think, like, if somebody looks over my shoulder when I'm doing my emails, they say, "God." these total strangers are pouring out their heart to you. What the hell? <laughs> and I say, no, I, I get it because they just listened to me for two hours. And so now for them to email me a mere four paragraphs is understandable. You know, it's, it's, it's a conversational human reciprocation. If somebody mm. was speaking at you for two hours and now it's your turn to say something back, of course you'd, you'd share something back in return for all this person just shared. It's, it's, um, I think it's totally understandable. And in fact, I think it's usually wonderful. I mean, every now and then there's, of course, like the one out of a thousand that um, indulges a little too much, a little <laughs> too inconsiderately and, and starts to project stuff onto me. But those situations are so, so rare. People think they're more common, but no, it's really rare for me. I mean, luckily, I'm glad I'm not as famous as Tim. Uh, so people don't, you know, total strangers don't project onto me that much. So um, I think it's great. And the, the I've met some amazing people, like I said, I mean, not just romances, but um, just some really cool people around the world and people that have, you know, literally completely across the world from Mozambique or something. And then they happen to be passing through where I live and we meet up in person because we've emailed them a few times and 
how cool is that? You know, I, I love it. I get actually a great sense of security from all the cool people I've met around the world. Yeah. And you know, you talk about podcasts and going on podcasts and you could grow your business and your brand. You don't talk about also <laughs> building relationships and being in right. with people. I need, I have yeah. to go. I have to go here, Derek. So you're yeah. saying you basically had two partners out of Tim Ferriss's podcast. Yeah. <laughs> at, at two and a half. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's just the initial I mean, okay, we'll use, I, I, I'll not name names, but the woman I was actually just speaking with an hour ago, we're just dear friends now. But yeah, um, yeah, she emailed me like the day after it went on the air. She listened to it uh, while walking around Prague one day and uh, ended up then checking out my other stuff and then sent me this long email that was just like amazing. She's an amazing person, just absolutely brilliant. She's a scientist in Sydney with an amazing background. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, we emailed a few times. And I just said, wow, you're, I want to know you. You're a really, really interesting person. So I said, uh, what's your phone number? And we got on the phone. We started talking every day. And, you know, one thing led to another. So um, then, yeah, that happened a couple of years later. And then a year after that. And, yeah, good stuff. Wow. I've I've not heard a story like that before. So <laughs> uh, I, I feel like the the walls, but politely put there that I shouldn't push any further on details. Uh, so I won't. Well, you know, I mean, after that is, yeah. I mean, there's always the, you know, how you meet somebody is not that important, especially when so many people say, oh, you know, we met on Tinder or whatever. Uh, so I think it's actually much cooler to meet people that find you because you're putting yourself out there. Mm. You know, whether, I mean, I'd like to think that if somebody was a painter, constantly painting and putting their paintings out there, and the kind of person who falls in love with their artwork is probably somebody that you'd you'd be more likely to want to meet that person instead of just a random stranger at the pub. Somebody who was moved by your art is somebody that it just, na it becomes a natural filter, you know? Mm -hmm. Somebody's moved by your writing or moved by anything you've put out there into the world. You know, that's a part of you. That's a part of your soul and if they already have been drawn to that that's a much better start than you know hey you're hot after a couple beers you know <laughs> yeah met you down the gym or the pub right, right? we met from the right. tim ferris show <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> uh, so derek i never ask people to, to do their own introductions i just it's not a thing i do um but i know Yay, good uh, all right so we don't uh, have to do that Phew. yeah yeah, and, and I'll, do, I'll do an introduction at the start when we record, and I always do them at the end once I've, you know, had the time with my guest as opposed to just going on Wikipedia. Right, um, right. And I um, I actually put some posts out in some of my communities getting people to guess who you were because I like to, to have fun and get them to guess rather than just saying them. Quite, quite a lot of people did guess, and so 50-50 split. Oh, yeah, Derek, I heard him on the Tim Ferriss show. I love him. And then half the people didn't know. So – what would you say you're most known for? Or what would you most like people to know that you're most known for? It's not just one thing. And that's my real answer. Because in 2008, I would have clearly said, yeah, I'm only known for CD Baby. And that's probably all I will ever be known for. And that was a really sad thought to me. You know, 2000 days when I sold CD Baby. And I felt like I've peaked. My best is behind me. Um, my gravestone will say he did CD Baby and nothing since, right? Um, but then in 2009, I got this inspiration that I really wanted to be like a TED speaker, writer, author kind of guy. And I did it. I nailed it. And I s spoke at the main stage TED conference three times in one year. Wow. And by 2010, 2011, everybody I met only knew me through TED and people would ask me, like, so what did you do before TED? I was like, yes. <laughs> I, I made it past the, you know, known only for CD Baby thing. And then my book came out, my book, Anything You Want, came out in 2011. And a lot of people only know me through my book uh, or the other stuff I've written about um, since then on my blog and my book. And they don't know that I did TED and they don't really know that I did CD Baby except for some, you know, one line in my bio. So, yeah, it's those three different things. It's my writing my speaking, and then this music company I started long ago. Mm. Now, there's a couple of things that have come out of there which I find fascinating, Derek, and one of them is why at still a relatively young age with so much life ahead of you, 
when you'd had one success, did you think that was going to be it? Why did you not think that was going to be many other things? I'm not money ambitious. Um, I think I'm not the kind of person that would say, you know, hey, you put me, drop me anywhere on earth with a dollar in my hand and I'll turn it to a million within a year. I'm not that guy because I don't care that much. Um, I'm ambitious in my ideas, but not in my bank account, you know? So mm. CD Baby got successful, I think through just dumb luck, or not dumb luck, smart luck, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, it was definitely really good timing where I started CD Baby just at the beginning of the first dot-com boom, got out just a month before the financial collapse of 2008. Just really nice timing. And that's why it was a hit. So I just felt like, still, I could I could say to this day that I probably will never create something that big again. But if my articles spread, uh, my books and my writing and my thoughts and all that, then yeah, that'd be cool. But I don't think I'm ever going to start a company like that. But I guess maybe at the time I was thinking that I was still in the entrepreneur mindset that, you know, a company is what you do as, as leaving your mark on the world, you know? Mm. Okay. And you said pretty much it sounded like within a year you got on Ted not once, not twice, but three times. How did you do that? Um, very deliberately. Um, I spent about a year being lost after I sold CD Baby. Um, and then at the time I was watching a lot of TED Talks. I don't anymore, but at the time I was really into it in 2008. And suddenly I just kind of got this flash of inspiration like, I want to be one of those people. Like I want the TED conference to invite me to speak. So I just went through it like very deliberately and meth methodically. Like I need to, to write something radically interesting every single day and share it as widely as I can and constantly um, pitch the TED conference with a bunch of different ideas that I think will fit perfectly into their thing. Um, and yeah, that's what I did. So yeah, just, it was a very deliberate process and I was, thrilled that it worked mm. and before we went on air Derek you said that you spent a good couple of hours um preparing for this interview which I'm flattered by although it's not about me it's about you I get that um I did the most research for the questions for you than I've ever done with any guest as well in a simultaneous <laughs> parallel universe because um one I thought well if I'm going to ask you to be on my show five times I should do some bloody work um, and the second thing was, you know, you asked for questions in advance, which a lot of my guests don't. And because I've got the sense if you're going to prepare, I should prepare. Um, and by the way, I haven't asked you any of those yet. Um, nope. but that's often the way I like things to start. But um, I did watch all of your TED Talks. I'd watched one before. I did watch them. I did watch as much of your content as I um, could find. And I find some of your ideas fascinating as someone who has built my own business and probably learned from the more, I don't know, traditional success classes, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I always found that an idea I thought I held, you challenged many of those ideas. Cool. And I really like that. I think you were the first person I listened to. You were almost like the, the anti-success, anti-business, anti-personal development, business success, personal development person. In, in, in a weird way. And I, and I, I love that. I, I felt like I was ready for that. Thank you. Um, By the way, do you know that that's, for what it's worth, that's intentional too, that, you know, when I talk about this thing in 2009, where I said I wanted to be like a, a TED speaker guy, I realized that TED Talks are only interesting if they surprise you. Mm. If somebody gets up there, no matter how emotional they be, may be, but if they only tell you stuff you already know, or especially if they only tell you their own life story, to me, it's just not interesting. You don't remember those. The ones you remember are the ones that make you go, huh, that's mm. that's weird. That's completely opposite of what I would have thought. That upends my expectations on this thing. And so therefore, I, I try to only put out into the world things that are surprising. Uh, because, yeah, if you just tell somebody what they already know, then it might even help motivate them a tiny bit. But it's not that interesting. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. That was it was a nice compliment, and and uh, it's because I I try to just do that thing. Yeah, just, I, thank you. 
a, a, and that's how I meant it to be a compliment because I, I really got that sense. And I think it probably started my, I don't, I don't know what this look I'm trying to do is, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but it's like, uh, think laterally, think different, but not think laterally and different in a conventional sense. I know that sounds like a paradox. No, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. So one of, that leads us into one of the questions that I prepared uh, based on, you know, a really great answer I saw from you. Uh, and, and that is about leadership being all over glorified. Um, and, and I got the sense that you felt in a lot of ways leadership or being the first was over glorified. And I'd love your take on that. Sure. Um, OK, so this is from my it's from my TED talk about the, the dancing guy and the first mm. follower thing. So it's a video of a shirtless guy dancing. And I think that he gets all the credit for starting this movement of dancers. But if you watch it again and you watch closely, I think it's the first guy that followed him that really got everybody else to follow. Until then, he was just a weirdo dancing and you didn't really want to follow him. It wasn't until one person had the guts to imitate him, then that person made it cool. So the meta lesson here is I think that um, like everybody likes the story of a single person that gets the credit, right? Like when you say, no, 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 it wasn't me, you know, it was the team. We say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And rationally we say, okay, I'm, I'm sure it took more than this one person. But on a more instinctual gut, emotional level, we still think it's the one person that gets the credit, right? So in Richard Branson's autobiography, I think it was um, Losing My Virginity, he said, I found that the press would only write about Virgin if they had a face to put to the company's name. And Richard Branson is a naturally shy guy. He didn't want to do it, but he was very um, ambitious and wanted Virgin to be a huge success. So it was only after he saw, oh, okay, if I let them use me as like a human interest story, my company gets a lot more media. He saw the results of that and he saw that they were getting way more media coverage if they let them cover him if he stepped into the spotlight only then did he somewhat reluctantly and then enthusiastically step into the spotlight so that's the pr angle that's the media angle but in reality behind the scenes the truth is it takes a great team to get anything done right like a charismatic leader with a bad team will fail but an uncharismatic leader with a great team is more likely to succeed. So to me, that's just the proof that leadership is over glorified because it makes for a more interesting story. But the truth is, it's the team that makes things happen. Mm. And I think what you mentioned just then, and I remember you making this point very strongly in this TED talk, the courage of that second person. Um, right. They, they took the... I know the first person, like you said, the first person is always the light is shone on them. But that second right. person who risks the ridicule and, you know, if I think about my team, you know, my MD and a couple of other early members of my team, you know, they took big risks. They, they mm -hmm. started my company when we were nothing yeah. and they've been with us 12 years and now we're something. But they took a massive mm -hmm. risk. I'd already taken my risk. You could definitely argue that they and they they went out of a corporate environment into an entrepreneurial environment working for this crazy nutter. So you could argue they had more courage than me and they took a bigger <laughs> leap of faith than me, a bit like mm -hmm. the second. Because the first guy's already crazy, isn't he? He's there, well, look at me, right. I'm dancing. He's already crazy, but the second yeah. one's got something to lose. Yeah, somebody has to make it easy to follow. So I think the first follower shows everybody else how to follow. And what you can do if you are in the position of the first if, if you're the lone nut, you know, that has nobody else following you yet, if you're somebody listening to this and you want to go pioneer something, but you want people to start following you and contributing, I think the best thing you can do is to make yourself easy to follow. And what that means is to take the time to make clear instructions uh, on how to join and how to contribute and make it appealing and make it fun. Then most importantly, Try to develop a system from the beginning where your followers then can become leaders themselves so that the new followers are actually following your followers instead of just following you. Mm.
Yeah, I um, I find that fascinating because, like you said, when people give credit to the team, and I never really thought about it like this until you sort of said it, Derek, but in a way that's just lip service, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's yeah. Just, it's Rationally. just sound bite. It's a difference between head and heart, right? It's like in our yeah. head we can go, yeah, okay, I know Elon Musk isn't sitting there making all those cars himself. Um, he didn't invent everything. I know Steve Jobs himself didn't invent the iPhone. We know that rationally, but our heart still thinks that, well, yeah, Steve Jobs, iPhone, iPhone, Steve Jobs. Oh, yeah, the Tesla, mm. Elon Musk. Um, we, we still think it's one person emotionally, even if we don't rationally. Mm. Hi, it's Rob. Quick interruption here to make sure you like this video and you subscribe to the channel. We are upping our content game, bringing you the most disruptive interviewees and guests and content, and not just the people who do the usual circuit. So make sure you like, subscribe, and now let's get back to the interview. Something I've always struggled with most of my life, Derek, uh, which is why I wanted to ask you this question, it is... Um, Maybe the fear of being disliked, ridiculed, not valued, not noticed, um, embarrassed, shamed, bullied. I used to be really overweight as a kid. Mm. Um, and I shook the weight when I was about 11, but only really the last few. I mean, business has kind of hardened me up a little bit, but it's still <laughs> there inside. Right. I and I know you've, got some, you've got some thoughts on um, developing the thinking to be have the courage to be ridiculed. Because I, I, I don't know, for me, it's never really gone away, that mm -hmm. feeling inside. But maybe the courage to face it has got stronger. Mm -hmm. It's not, not like the demons are gone. It's right. just that I'm prepared to face them. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, having the courage to be disliked? Can you just go, oh, well, it doesn't matter and brush it off? Or do you have to somehow develop a, some strategies to cope? Yeah, I think it's, Developing a strategy that maybe more accurately could be called a stance, which is to amplify your quirks instead of downplaying them. So to just set yourself apart from the crowd at every step, right? So it's like, for example, if you don't like meeting with people, well, then go all the way, right? Like move to the middle of nowhere, loudly announce that you don't meet with anyone for any reason, and just amplify that present, uh, that preference, right? So you'll attract those that wish that they could or would do the same, right? Um, if you express your quirks at every stage of the way, like even in your communication with your clients, the way that you email people, the the way that your website looks should reflect your quirky personality and not just be the template WordPress thing, you know? Um, so let's use as a good role model, like hardcore musicians. And I mean, hardcore in any way, right? It could be like a country speed punk metal band, but <laughs> I was in the music business for 10 years. And so what I love is that sometimes when you meet these characters that have some kind of speed punk band, they don't go, oh, hello, Mr. Servers. I'm calling to get my band up on your service. No, instead they're like, hey, what's up, motherfucker? How you doing, man? <laughs> man you releasing this drop and it's going to kick you in the balls. In fact, it's going to rip your balls off and then kick them, man. We want to get this thing distributed through you. How do we do it, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> and you just like, you can't help but laugh when talking to this somebody that's doing that because they're not trying to please anyone. They are loudly being who they are. And in fact... That's deeper branding by just going all the way. Instead of trying to be generic, you amplify what's weird about you. You know, like we all could take a lesson from that. Um, take some extreme niche and just go all the way with it. Um, it. Whether it's being the most expensive, you know, the imagine if you're a dentist in a small town and you announce that you're going by referral only, you will not just see anybody. You're only going to see people that are referred by a quality customer you know that just even that one little move would just put you into this uh you know um high luxury category like no 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 no, we don't just work with anybody um maybe you want to be the most mysterious or the most ridiculous you know whatever your niche may be you amplify it um my favorite example of this is cards against humanity actually sorry my favorite example example is the uh speed kunk speed punk band but my second favorite example the current one that we can all see on wikipedia 
go to the Wikipedia page for Cards Against Humanity. It's a board game, uh, like a card game with you know things written on the cards. It's like a party game. But look up on their Wikipedia page how they have an annual Black Friday promotions. And they do the most ridiculously hilarious things every year for Black Friday, digging ditches and dumping money into it and whatever. And, and man, they have just such an amazing creative statement behind them, which mm. then to me is just right off the bat says, no, we're not just an average Mattel board game. We're not trying to please everybody. We're taking a niche. Uh, yeah, if I could be any company today, I would be Cards Against Humanity. I just love what they're doing. Um, but your real question was about the courage to be ridiculed. Mm. So I think that if you do these kind of things I'm talking about, then when somebody ridicules you or makes fun of you, you think, in a way you think, well, then I'm doing something right, right? Like if you loudly proclaim that you are the most expensive and somebody says, yeah, get, get off it, get off your high horse. You go, uh-huh, there we go. That's what I want. I want you to scoff at how expensive I am because that means my niche is being communicated, right? Mm. If, if you look at Sivers.org, if you look at my website, it's very, very plain on purpose. I don't use any templates or frameworks. I wrote every line of that HTML by hand and I don't stick in a single line that doesn't need to be there. It is plain and fast and minimal and that's my thing, right? Mm. Um, the way that I write, there's not a sentence that doesn't need to be there. Um, so my website is you know, on point with my writing, which is my niche. That's my thing. So when people do occasionally, about once a month, I get an email, usually from a web designer who says, oh, God, mm -hmm. your site is so ugly. Come on, let me, let me design you a better site. And I go and look at their site, and it's just some typical WordPress thing. You know, um, I think, no, thank you. The fact that you call my site, site ugly means I'm doing something right. <laughs> and to add on to that, how do you not take things personally if you're that kind of person? Um, Cause I think a lot of people are, I coach and mentor a lot of entrepreneurs and things get through your skin sometimes. Social um, media, you know, how, how do you not take things personally? You, well, for one, you have to know that the public you is not you. That if I could wish one thing for everybody, on the internet, I would wish that everybody would have used a stage name. Like we would all have an internet name and not a single human on earth would use their real name on the internet. So therefore, if somebody is criticizing um, <laughs> Tracy Rainbows for her ridiculous marketing campaign, well then Tracy Rainbows knows that what they're, adver what they're attacking is her avatar that she put out there, her stage name. You know, um, I'm sure Bono knows if somebody's criticizing Bono, that that's not his real name. So if somebody criticizes Bono, he knows that they're criticizing the public persona that he's put out there, right? So that's, yes, that's a rock star, but I think we all have our version of this, that, that you know, Rob Moore, what Rob Moore puts out into the world is not the whole and complete person. You put out an aspect of yourself into the world and if somebody attacks that, well, that's not you. That's a cardboard cutout of you that they're throwing tomatoes at. Um, the real you is at home with your family. Uh, the public you is not you. And if you really adopt this mindset, uh, which I did about 13, well, specifically 13 years ago, uh, I wrote an article that was very, very unpopular and everybody attacked it. And then I realized that all these people attacking it didn't know me at all. And in that moment, it was like, I, I disconnected. I cut the, the connection between my public self and my real self. Um, but this also means then, if the public you is not you, then you can't take praise personally either. Um, when somebody praises you, they're praising your public persona not the real you. So you just kind of, to me, I just disconnect from my public self. I wish in hindsight, I would have made a stage name, but it's too late now. But for anybody who hasn't put themselves out into the world too much yet, I highly recommend 
make a stage name not not a you know not a ridiculous tracy rainbows one like i just made up but something that's believable where people might think it's your real name but you'll know that that's not the real you i think that's one of the mm. best things you could do to um to keep that separation between the public you and the real you yeah i've never heard someone use the analogy like that i've heard people say don't think take things personally they don't know the real you etc but i think the way that you've just explained it there i think it's brilliant actually derek because i think that um it's easier to do that when you've got a, a moniker an alter ego uh, you know like if you're playing computer games with your mates and you're all some random crazy you know superman or something right nothing's gonna hurt you is it right yeah so that article what was it the 13 years ago article that made oh, it was, I mean, no, it's boring. It's, um, I had switched from the PHP programming language to Ruby on rails for two years. And after two years of trying to make Ruby on rails, do what I wanted, I switched back to PHP and on a little technical blog that I had at the time on somebody else's website, I was like a guest blogger on somebody else's site. Um, I wrote a little article for an audience of nobody about the seven technical reasons why I switched back to PHP after Ruby on Rails. And I went to bed that night. When I woke up in the morning, like all the technical blogs had it as like their top ranked number one article and hundreds of commenters were attacking me personally. And uh, because people, it, for programmers, choice of programming language is like religion, right? It would be, it would be like I criticized someone's religion. And so yeah, <laughs> it, it brought out all the attacks and for about a minute, they hurt my feelings, and then I just snapped and disconnected. Yeah, yeah that's definitely a liberating moment where if if someone can do that, like you said, cut the cord. Yeah. Uh, so I had a really interesting conversation with Mark Randolph, who's one of the original founders of Netflix, and he said something to me that really got me to think, and I really enjoyed it. Because if I'm honest, Derek, I, I, I am a bit of a creative soul. I love art. I love music. Maybe that's one of the ways I resonated listening to you because I got that sense. Um, and so I must admit every now and again, or maybe too much, to be honest, I got, I got this great idea. And I've, you know, I'm already trying to convince everyone and I know it's right and it's brilliant. And I've had a eureka moment and I am a genius. <laughs> and, and, and Mark said, no, all ideas are rubbish. And I was like, oh. And also having been a business owner for 15 years, a marketer, a tester, I also know that actually no idea is really any good until it's been probably tested anyway. Mm -hmm. Where do you sit with all ideas are bad and, you know, how much should we fight for our ideas or how much should it be a, an A-B split test? I wrote this article. Uh, if you go to sivers.org slash multiply, it's my article about how uh, ideas – are just a multiplier of execution. And yeah, an idea itself is worth basically nothing if you don't execute on it. And what's funny is there's this really interesting guy in New York City named um, James Altucher. Mm -hmm. And James Altucher says that he writes down 20 new ideas every day or something like that. And he encourages everybody else to do the same. And something about that just bothered me and I wasn't sure what it was. And just this morning while peeing, I, uh, <laughs> Back to that. I, I, um, <laughs> I thought, you know, here's the problem. Is it, if you're somebody who just say, let's take this to two extremes. Say you're somebody that comes up with 20 new ideas every single day. Well then by doing that, almost by definition, you don't have time to execute on those ideas. So now let's take the other extreme. Imagine you're somebody that comes up with one idea every 10 years. And so for 10 years, you do nothing but execute that one idea full time for 10 years. Given those two extremes, I'd place my bet on the success of the second person that has one idea and executes it every day for 10 years. And maybe the reason I thought about this out of the blue was knowing that we were having this interview tonight. Um, I thought about CD Baby again, which I don't, I actually don't think about CD Baby much. It seems like two lifetimes ago, but I mean, I'm 50 now and I started it when I was 27, right? So I did that one damn thing for 10 years 
And I remember there was a certain point when the company was like eight years old that somebody pointed out to me, they said, do you know that you actually haven't changed your website one single bit in five years? And I went, huh. I went and kind of like looked at the change logs. I was like, yeah, you're right. I hadn't made a single pixel, a single line of HTML change to the website in five years. It was just churning around and the sales were doubling every single year. I added nothing to it. I added no new ideas. I just kept executing that one single idea for 10 years straight. And I think that's why it was a success. People wanted me to branch out. Like, well, not, Some people would say, hey, man, why don't you start selling DVDs? Why don't you start doing this? And one well-meaning friend of mine is like, you know, you could make a lot of money if we started distributing porn. I'm like, mm, uh, no, I'm not looking for new ideas. Let's, I'm executing this one idea is all I can do right now. And everything's doubling in size every year. So no, I'm good. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I was thinking about that ideas versus execution thing, right? So I, th I think whenever you're not sure where you stand on something, just do a hypothetical of taking it to two extremes, right? Like the person that comes up with a hundred ideas a day, the person that comes up with one idea every 10 years. Um, when you spell it out really um, extreme like that, it kind of helps you figure out where you might take a stand on that. Mm. I I'm fascinated by this. I could almost just now talk about this for the whole of the rest of the interview, sure. which <laughs> I won't, but I could, um, <laughs> because of a lot of preparation. But I'm going to challenge that a little bit, Derek, and let's see mm -hmm. where we go. Because I I I there could be an argument that maybe you need to – I remember watching Ed Sheeran documentary – and he said, you've got to go and write a load of rubbish songs. And you, you cannot write a good song until you've gone and written a load of rubbish songs. And obviously, he's a brilliant writer. And, I, I, you know, I love studying front men or people who, who write music. Um, and I've heard that before. You've got to like, write, write a lot of rubbish. So yep. if, you're, if you're waiting for the one Eureka once every 10 years idea, have you, you haven't been able to maybe write a lot of rubbish songs? Yeah. Um... You're actually making me realize that there was, there was more to this thought that I forgot about. This is one of the things I didn't write down. I literally was just thinking about it this morning, and then you asked. Um, <laughs> that I thought, actually, um, here would be the, if I were to prescribe a recipe for someone, it would be this. It would be, yes, generate lots of ideas at the beginning. And for every single one of them, find a way to put them out there for testing. You know, like the uh, that book, The Lean Startup, suggests. Mm. Um, actually make kind of a fake launching page for every one of your ideas. Um, whether it's a physical product or a service that you have in mind, make the launching page first before you do anything else. And tell the world about it and see how many people sign up as interested. Um, especially if you're actually asking for a credit card and if people seem willing to pull out their credit cards to pay for this thing. And if enough people sign up, then you go do the next steps and make the business happen. But if not enough people sign up as interested, then you just let the idea go. So my prescription would be to do lots of this ideation up front. And then when you've found the idea that the world seems to like, and it and you launch it and it's working then stop this ideation process and just execute like crazy on that one idea and in hindsight i guess that's what i did you know before i started cd baby i did lots and lots of things that failed um and then this one silly little hobby idea of mine took off and that's the thing that i focused on for 10 years so yeah mm. that's that's a more nuanced more specific recipe yeah I because I guess there's a lot of people, I'm trying to put my um, myself in the shoes of many of my listeners who've not yet had their CD baby idea, you know, right. or their iPhone idea, et cetera. So they're still on that journey. And I also speak to a lot of entrepreneurs who have convinced themselves they're not creative and they don't have good ideas, which I personally think is nonsense. I yeah. think everybody has good ideas. So I guess what I like about, you know, 20 ideas for the sake of it, and okay, I can see why. I guess creating ideas can get your idea muscle stronger. Mm -hmm. I think you could get better at coming up with ideas by practicing coming up with ideas. Um, and I don't know how you do that without having failures, etc. But as I think about myself, I, I, I've not 
particularly have high self-worth in all areas, Derek, but one area I do is, I know I'm good at coming up with quite a lot of ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's because I was drawing when I was four and five years old and I just always had ideas. And so I guess I practiced it like you'd practice a martial art or anything like that. Right. Um, To all those people out there that don't think they're creative and don't think they have good ideas, I, I, I guess I'd like this discussion maybe to give them a little bit of guidance or confidence that actually it could be something they can practice and get better at. You know, like you would anything else. Yeah. And ultimately you don't need a great idea. Ultimately business is just helping people. It's just being a public servant. Um, You're just helping people with whatever they need help with. So if a lot of people in your neighborhood are saying, I need help shoveling snow or mowing my yard, or I need help fixing my website. Well, then if you just help all those people that need help, well, now you've got a successful business. Um, even though there was no brilliant idea there, it doesn't, you don't have to be super creative to help people. You just have to help them. Mm. And ultimately that's what it's all about. So I think this idea of, um, you know, needing to have a great idea comes from these occasional pseudo genius ideas where nobody knew that they wanted an iPhone until it existed, right? Um, uh, nobody knew that the existing Hoover vacuums were not that impressive until Dyson came along and did a better one. Uh, so that takes a certain level of um, creative genius. You know, they say the difference between uh, genius and just smart is that the the genius is the one that sees things that the rest of us can't see. Um, it's not just about being very skilled at something. So yeah, there's there's a place for those wow innovations every now and then, but 99% of the businesses out there that are successful are not wow innovations. They're just, a lot of them are just ditch diggers. You know, uh, did you read Felix Dennis's book called How to Get Rich? Yeah, loved it. Loved it. Know, me too. Absolutely loved it. Do you remember when he made the point that, that some of the most successful business people he knows are the ones that are literally digging ditches and doing sewage management and waste yeah. management and stuff like that? And it's like, you know, so he said everybody wants to chase the exciting, glamorous idea. Everybody wants to be like a Hollywood movie producer or, Mm. or, you know, two years ago, it was suddenly everybody wanted to be in Bitcoin, blockchain. And um, he said, you know, the most successful people I know are the ones that are just doing the humdrum work that needs to be done. Mm. They're not big idea people. So yeah, I'd, I'd rather just kind of pop this notion that you need to be a big idea person. I am really glad we pushed a bit on that question and went a bit deeper on it, Derek. Because I've got a lot here, and I'm thinking, oh, does Derek got till 2026? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I get till 2026. Sure. <laughs> Lay it on. I'm me. really, glad, I'm really glad we did because I've always thought that, and you, you're far more artic- articulate than me, Derek. So you say it with more poise and less words. But this is exactly what I've been thinking. There's too much pressure for an idea to be a great one. That's the problem. Most like Tetra Pak. It's just milk cartons, and that's made the, 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 the parents and then the, the kids and then the grandkids all billionaires. Yeah. My friend David McCourt is a billionaire. He lays cables. Yeah, you, not, 90, I'd even go 99.99% of ideas. They're yeah. just simple solutions to problems hidden in plain sight. Yeah. But if we're going, oh, man, a, an idea, creative, you've got to be a genius, you've got to get the wow, which I think that's glorified, You, I think that's – if people don't get a light bulb moment listening to that, well, then, you know, I think you're going to get lots more people wanting to go out with you now, Derek, from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't help but be influenced by the media, right? You know, things get glorified. You know, they're not doing fancy cover stories on Fast Company magazine or whatever. Is that still around? Um, you know, they're not doing these glory stories on the ditch diggers. Mm. Uh, even if, like you say, they're making billions. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so something else that really fascinated me that you said, which was another one of those head tilters. Sometimes my dog looks at me like that, but it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and you said these sometimes or often the most successful person is the third person that comes to mind. And I think that's got to be worth resharing. Mm. What about me? Well, I, I didn't say that. I said okay. it's more interesting to think. Ah about the third person that comes to mind. I think that 
the first and second thing that come to mind um, aren't very interesting because they're just, they're automatic reflex. Um, again, like we're all influenced by mass media, right? So if somebody says, uh, if I say, name a famous painting, you say, uh, Mona Lisa. That's not interesting, right? We all went there in our head. Famous painting, Mona Lisa. Um, name a genius, Einstein. It's just too obvious. It's not interesting. So then you think, well, okay, don't say the first thing that comes to mind. Who's the second one that comes to mind? And you go, mm, 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 Richard Feynman? Okay, well, even that's pretty obvious. Okay, so what's the third genius that would come to mind? Huh. Now you start thinking slowly. You start thinking, well, wait, genius of what? Genius of cooking? Genius of wordplay? You, now you take a minute to go beyond your first reaction. So what I meant is I didn't say that the most successful person is the third person. I meant, I went, Tim was asking me, who's the, when I say successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? And I just say, eh, I, I just disagree with the question. That's not a fun question. Let's not talk about the first thing that comes to mind. Let's talk about the third thing that comes to mind. It doesn't mean the third thing is more successful. It's just more interesting to talk about. Mm. And I guess if you had that thought process in a lot of things you do, what's the third best idea? What's the third anything that could take you places you, you've never gone before? Right. And I do this a lot in life. Um, so many times. I, I doubt myself. Um, I'm a skeptic in the kind of original philosophical Michelle Montaigne version of the word where I don't even believe a word I say. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I tell myself, I want to travel, I go, hmm, do you? Really? I don't know. I doubt it. Let me, let me disprove that. You know, mm -hmm. so I try to, whenever I hear myself express a preference, I try to shoot it down. Whenever I ex say that this is true and that is false, I immediately think, hmm, is it? Wait, let me think about the opposite. What if that's false and this is true? Could that be? You know, like this is this is where I get to the more interesting things. This is when I when I pick things apart, I feel I get closer to at least something interesting and maybe even something more true. Because lots of times, like my Mona Lisa Einstein example, the first thing that comes to mind is just some habitual thing that we've been saturated in our media exposure to just say as like a default, you know, what do you do on Mother's Day? Call your mother. Um, did, did you question that? Like, did you really, is that the best thing to do on Mother's Day is to send her flowers and call your mother? It, would that be the most, what is the reason of that to make her feel special? Well, isn't that about the least special thing you could do if you think about it? Um, you know, all these picking things apart like that and doubting yourself and going past your first reaction yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do in life. And I actually just wrote down a line, why do you doubt yourself? I'll just go there a bit in case there's something deeper. So do you doubt yourself because you like to second guess and question yourself, or do you doubt yourself because there's something deeper in that? Um, I think that our actions reveal our values much better than our words do. So if you've been saying for years, I want to start a business, you've been telling anybody who will listen for years now, I want to start a business. I really want to start a business. I want to start a business. But if you haven't done it, then I think you'd be very wise to start ignoring your words and look at your actions, right? That's just one example. It could be, I, you know, I want to quit smoking. <laughs> I want to this, I want to that. Or, uh, you know, I, I really want a serious relationship. Okay, well, then why do you keep sleeping around with people at bars? You know, um, whatever it may be, your actions reveal the truth better than your words do. And so that's just mm -hmm. one one example of this. Um, but yeah, sometimes we we echo, no, not echo. Yeah, okay, sometimes we just echo things that the people around us believe, and so we just, enough people around us say, um, it's important to come up with lots of ideas, <laughs> and we, that, like the one we were just talking about, and you go, Ooh. yeah, well, yeah, it's important to come up with lots of ideas. You might find yourself just echoing something because the people around you say it, but also you might 
still be saying something that used to be true for you 10 years ago, and you've just been saying it now out of habit without stopping to question if it's still true, because life changes, you change, circumstances change, the world changes. You've been declaring something is true for a long time without questioning it. It can be really useful to stop and pull apart and doubt everything you say. If only then, if you find that you deconstruct it and you attack it and you try to reverse it and you say, no, actually, this is still true. Okay, great. Well, now you've just, you've taken time to, you know, take apart that machine and put the machine back together again. It's a good, good proof that uh, you still know that that machine is solid and well built, right? Um, mm. Sorry, I, was, I don't know why I was just picturing a little gearbox somehow. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's why I think it's healthy regardless to doubt everything you say so that if it's still true, you'll, you can reprove it true. But if it's not true, then now's the best time to find out. Mm. So I've got a couple of questions, three, I think, that are very specific for entrepreneurs. Mm. But before we go there, there's a couple of things that are loitering in my head with intent that won't leave, why five years and no interviews? That was very, when you said that, that was like, oh, I believe Derek. He, you know, he didn't do any. Why were you no interviews for so long? And also why why do you seem pretty clear that you don't want to start another company, you know, I, I suppose, oh. in the maybe CD baby was? Um, okay, Uh no interviews. Mm. There's Sorry, no I shouldn't have asked you at the no, same no, time. No, 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 it's okay. I can handle it. <laughs> um, uh, the no interviews was because I found myself being up on the metaphorical podium, giving answers to everybody's questions. And that accidentally put me in a mindset of feeling like I had all the answers. Um. And I wanted to be the person with the questions, not the answers. So, in fact, you are the second to last interview I am doing for a long, long time. I have started saying no to all interviews again now. I'm doing one more again next week, and then that's it for a long time. Um, because I found myself accidentally, once again, feeling like I had the answers. So I think that's a dangerous mindset. I'd rather... Um, yeah, I'd rather be questioning everything than answering everything. Mm. So the business, um, I didn't like having all that responsibility of, I had 85 employees and I didn't like that. Um, I didn't like that I couldn't just completely disappear. Um, later, my last two years of running the business, I, I kind of could disappear. It was running completely without me, but still like being the figurehead of the company, still people kind of dumped their problems on me or rather they blamed me for their unhappiness if they were unhappy. Um, and I just didn't like that responsibility. So I think I much prefer the career path or the, let's say the work habits of a novelist or a painter who just makes things alone you know, I'm just a natural introvert. I really, really like solitude. I just love doing things by myself. So this idea of having a team of people reporting to me and all that, mm, I don't really want that again. Mm. And what do you fill your time with now? What what does this lone painter do with his time? <laughs> I'm writing. Mo I mean, uh, most hours I'm awake. If I'm not with my kid, I'm writing whether that's writing computer code, writing my next book, uh, writing emails, uh, preparing uh, for an interview like this. You know, it's almost always my fingers are on a keyboard uh, flying most waking hours uh, from 6 a.m. to midnight, you know, and I love that. That's mm. my favorite lifestyle. Great. So <laughs> great. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> no, sorry. Derek. Derek. I don't want you to hate me now. No, that was just my my terrible attempt at traversing to the next question. Actually, let's talk about that now. Um, this is a completely random one. Um, I interviewed Jordan Belfort a couple of weeks back, and a few people were like, oh, Rob, well, you know, you're not really engaging in a conversation. You kind of finish a question, you go on to the next. 
I'm going to tell you a little fear I have and something I've never figured out. The perfect way to traverse from one question to the other, which you just highlighted very well because I went great, which didn't mean to sound patronising, but did. Um, it did. That was my attempt to move to the next question. <laughs> you can't have a two-hour conversation without breathing, can you? And I've, you know, I want to honour you by answer, asking the questions I've got. You've no, been wait, I have... <laughs> I'm just talking shit. Um, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I highly recommend go find a podcast called Conversations with Tyler. Okay. Tyler Cowen, C-O-W-E-N, is an economist at George Mason University, and his podcast called Conversations with Tyler is so damn interesting because um, he gets these amazing guests on, and he does a ton of research on them. Like, literally, he'll say that he'll do, like, you know, 50 hours of research, reading all of their books, listening to all their past works before they're on the show, and he comes prepared with the most specific questions, right? Like he'll get a politician on and is, and he'll say, okay, uh, everybody, my guest here today is Emily such and such from so-and-so. And here's my first question. Why is Russian ballet superior to French ballet? And she'll say, wow, I'm amazed that you know that about me. Here's exactly why Russian ballet is French ballet. You know, and so she'll answer that. And he'll say, um, what's your opinion on the food of East India versus West India? And she'll say, oh, East India is best because da 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 And the reason he has these specific questions is because he did so much research, he knows that his interviewee has strong opinions on Russian versus French ballet or East versus West Indian food. And so he just peppers them with these non sequitur questions. He says the one sentence question, no blah, 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 blah leading up to it, says the question, lets them answer. And as soon as they answer that question, boom, he lets fly with his next non sequitur question. It's fascinating. It's one. Of, it's one of my probably my, my single favorite interviewer I've ever heard. So never feel bad about just jumping to the next question with uh, no sequitur. Is a sequitur a thing? You know what I mean. Hmm. <laughs> now I'm going to try and do it. <laughs> uh, I, I, we we want to let's practice it. Do it. Just, yeah. Like just pepper me with a few questions. Let's try it. Okay, I'm going to do that in a minute. But okay. I, 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 we're in a place now where I know my listeners like me to go, i.e. when I'm a bit lost. I, I've had so much feedback that they like that. And what, what we've just inadvertently brought out here is what I find the hardest part of an interview, which is um, traversing from question to question to question to question to question to question, to question without going, oh, thank you. Great. Like I did. And, you know, had you not reacted like that, we wouldn't have had this discussion. Um so I, that is the hardest part for me. The hardest part. <laughs> uh, uh, in the early days, I, I interviewed Dorian Yates and I was terrible. I just terrible. Yeah, I would be terrible, terrible. too. I don't, I'm much more comfortable being the interviewee. I, I, don't, I think I would be pretty bad at being the interviewer. So I admire that you're putting your ass on the line <laughs> and doing this. Thank you for doing it. Oh, my pleasure. What do entrepreneurs need to stop doing? <laughs> I can't take this seriously. <laughs> hey, you know what? Okay, ask me the next four questions and let's do rapid fire for uh, the next five questions. Yeah, cool. I've got a rapid fire round, so that's easy. I can do that there. Um, can we do it do now? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do it. All right, yeah, let's, let's upend it. Let's do my usual finishing rapid fires because I'm good at this part. What's the best advice you've ever received? I've never received good advice. What's the worst advice you've ever received? Get married. What's one thing that you feel is wrong with the world that you would love to change? Um, entrepreneurs thinking of themselves first. The most common question I've ever heard on a podcast is what advice would you give your younger self? So what advice would you give your 75 year old self? <laughs> Drink laxatives. <laughs> if there's one person you think I should interview alive on this planet, who would it be? Bjork. 
This podcast has the word disruptive in it, disruptive entrepreneur. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Um, uh, that we should all stop rupting. <laughs> <laughs> I survived, Derek. I survived. <laughs> wait, wait, I don't know what... It's funny, I, I, I never really questioned that word, disruptive. Well, then what is ruptive if we're dissing it? If, if it's the opposite of ruptive, what is ruptive? Huh, that's a fun one. <laughs> but what about the, uh, do you want to ask me, um, what do modern entrepreneurs need to stop doing? Yeah, that was the one I was trying to ask you for yeah. two times, Derek. Think, thinking of themselves first. Do you want to ask me, why don't you need a, a business plan or big ideas? Do you want to take the interview, Derek? <laughs> 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 well, you had this this question that you emailed me in advance about why don't you need a business plan or big ideas? And I sat with that one for a while and I thought, well, wait, why do you? Like, why does anybody think that they need this? I think it's, that's just become one of these little things that, that people say mm. that we need, but I don't think we would have come to it naturally. Just like, for example, I don't think anybody in nature would have decided that midnight is when it becomes the next day, right? Like, that's a very contrived thing that someone somewhere came up with midnight, that's when the next day begins. No, nobody would ever say that this moment when the sky is black and it's now still black, that's the next day. Um, so to me, like creating a business is just like being a public servant, right? I said that before. It's when you're here to serve. It's like you're, you're kind of asking the world, what do you need? How can I help? Uh, I'm at your service. What can I do? Now, you don't need a business plan to be a public servant. Uh, that wouldn't even enter your head, I don't think. But mm. people tell us that we we need it. So I think that's just a, a weird thing that we hear from others that isn't true. Um, you want to ask me about the one thing you need to do to get anything you want? <laughs> You're making it life really easy for me. I was going to come back to these ones, Derek. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back, if you don't mind. Because okay. I'd like to go to this one a little bit deeper. So Because okay. you said it, but then we r rushed it. What do entrepreneurs need to stop doing? A bit deeper on that. Yeah. Um, so what I said is they need to stop thinking of themselves first. And I didn't really boil it down like that until in 2015, they were re-releasing my book from 2011 called Anything You Want, which Seth Godin published it in 2011 on his little publishing company. In 2015, he sold it to Penguin, so they re-released it. And they wanted a blurb for the inside cover. And they, they wrote something for me. They said something like, really, what it all comes down to is follow your passion. And I went, ew, oh, God, no, 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 no. Follow your passion? Ugh. No, that's not the point of the book at all. And they said, okay, then what do you want us to put there? Because we want to put something there. And I went, ah, all right, what does it all really come down to? And I had to ponder this, you know, this is going to get printed in my book, like right there on the back cover. So I thought about it. And the best answer I got was generosity. That I think the thing, at least, especially for a small business, but at any business, the thing that separates the really appealing businesses from those that aren't is generosity. That... If you're running a business, you're already probably luckier than most people in the world, just right there alone, by that fact alone, right? So you can afford to be generous. And I think the businesses that stand out, even if it's just one person providing a service business, is your generosity. It's doing more than is necessary. It's the opposite of being greedy. Um, and I find that the businesses that we detest is when they're putting their own needs above ours. And yeah, if I had to boil it down to one single thing, um, you know, a question like, what do entrepreneurs need to stop doing? Uh, I think it's that one thing is stop thinking of yourself. Stop thinking of yourself first. If you put your client's needs above your own so that you might even take a loss on this sale or whatever, that's, the best thing you could do your book is it called anything you want yes yeah and is the one thing 
you need to do to get anything you want generosity or is there something else have you already answered that question no i think the best thing you can do to get anything you want is to want much much less and i'm not just being a uh, taoist dude on the top of a mountain saying that um I've been thinking about that a lot lately with our, you know, we're in May 2020 now recording this with the whole COVID-19 situation. And I've been thinking about worst case scenarios a lot, which has got me thinking a lot about the minimum I need to be happy. So um, in, in four weeks, I'm moving and I'm not sure where I'm moving to. In fact, I'm not sure what country I'm moving to, but in four weeks, I'm moving. Um, and so it's got me thinking about, well, what do I really need to be happy? And I came up with just four things, you know, I need uh, quiet, uh, a decent temperature uh, where I'm not sweating or freezing. Um, I need to be near nature so I can go out for a walk. And I need somewhat of a view, not like, you know, top of a mountain, but something that's not just looking at the wall next to me 10 feet out my window. Um, those are the only four things I really need to be happy. Because if I have that, well, then I can flourish in my own everything on top of that is not really necessary. So I realize like, once again, I've done this so many times in life, I'm lowering and lowering and lowering what I need to be happy so that everything on top of that just feels like an extra bonus. Um, and I did that with money long ago. Like I was at the age of 22, I had saved up $12,000, which to me meant I was rich because my cost of living at the time was $800 a month. So at this point, I could quit my job. I wouldn't have to work for uh, indefinitely because I was making about $1,000 a month and spending $800 a month. I was like, there, I'm done. Um, I'm all set. And I've just tried to keep my needs low at all times. So yeah, how to get anything you want is to just think deeply about what you really want and then you know, try to want the littlest possible. I've been talking to a lot of entrepreneurs through this lockdown and I mentor quite a lot of people and one of the things I think that's been common in them is that they've sort of somewhat expected similar results now. And I've said to them, wait a minute, the world has completely changed. And in the last eight weeks, the fact that you're still here, and if you're making any money, that's bloody amazing. Well done you. Yes. And I don't think people are that good, myself included, at adjusting expectations for the environment or the situation. You know, that oh, but six months ago I made a plan and I'm not there. Well, no, but <laughs> look what yeah. happened. Yeah. And I, I am a big fan in uh, – I'm not the same in, uh, of that listening to you, Derek. I'm fascinated because I don't have this minimum viable happiness thing, <laughs> which I'm going to look into. I'm going to challenge myself because I'm surrounded by stuff. Um, very expensive stuff and I, I, I'm just different um, and I can get caught in the trap um, of Lamborghinis and Ferraris and you know everything else and I, I try and own them but not but say if you took it off from me today I'd be cool with that as well so I'm right, trying to get yeah. the best of both. enjoy yeah, it look at the beauty which is um, for, for the, sorry to interrupt but that's actually if you read a stoicism that's what they originally prescribed they said, yeah, go ahead, own wonderful, nice things. You should, just don't get too attached to them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't deny yourself the pleasures, have all the pleasures, mm -hmm. but just know that they might disappear at any time. Yeah, and don't be attached to it. And this is really important, know what your pleasures are. Because I think, for example, I have um, a record player. Like you could take my Lamborghini, you could probably take my children. You just can't take my record. <laughs> I just absolutely love my record player yeah and, and I'll, I'll spend money on that because i love that thing and but but that you know the the sound of the music that comes through that and the emotion that that makes me feel and i think yeah. maybe as i've got older that's what i've learned to learn to know what gives me pleasure not because someone yeah. says it does it's supposed to yeah um but i do like this idea that you've put in my head of i know you didn't say minimum viable happiness but it almost <laughs> is i only require those four things yeah. Um, so, yeah. So with this lockdown, I just think if you reset your expectations, um, like, for example, it's been beautiful weather for seven weeks. It's just not really been anything. Weirdly but, beautiful. Yeah. 
Yeah, like someone's someone where beyond us has been helping us out. <laughs> so, so I think being able to be agile in in adjusting your expectations to the environment and the situation, I think that will stop a lot of this, you know, mental health and the constant chase and the mm-hmm. the stress that there is with a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. So, what areas outside of business have taught you the most? inside of business was, was that a good transfer traverse between yeah that was questions? perfect i, I don't yeah. have a good answer for this unfortunately um the best i could think of is psychology because again you know i my whole take on business is no business is not business plans it's not financial plans it's not spreadsheets it's not profit and loss statements business is just serving people serving individuals um that's my whole personal perspective on business. That's what business is to me. It's serving individuals. So the only thing I can think of that really applies then is psychology. But um, it can be the psychology of, God, I mean, isn't it all psychology, really? I mean, marketing, that's so much of psychology. You know, sometimes it's the psychology of pricing. Uh, It was fascinating to learn that people given a placebo pill and told that, told that it's an expensive medication actually concretely felt uh, more relief from their pain and symptoms than people who were told that this placebo pill was uh, cheap. It just people uh, who paid more money for tickets were more likely to attend the show. Um, these things are fascinating. You know, the psychology of pricing, the psychology of, um, where you fit into the marketplace and the friendliness of your tone versus your standoffishness and how some people prefer the standoffishness and they aspire to be in the luxury crowd. And um, God, yeah, it's all psychology. So yeah, I guess I, I said I didn't have an answer. I guess I did. Psychology. Love it. But you, um, know, what? you know why I said I didn't have an answer? Because that's not surprising. It feels like a non-answer to me because it's just so obvious. Mm. Mm. Was there anything that you held as truth for a long time, but have recently changed your mind on? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to travel. Um, I want to live in a multicultural city. Uh, I want a dog. Uh, the thing we said earlier about how like the things I've been saying I want for years must be the things I want most. When in fact, I think I'm realizing those must be things I don't actually want if I've been saying it for years. Um, the best school is what's best for my kid. Um, minimalism means bringing nothing, nothing with me when I move. I thought that up until a few days ago. Um, I like having smart and famous friends. Yeah, those are those are seven off the top of my head. And do you think they've do you think they've changed for good, temporarily changed, or you've just challenged the fact that you held them as truths? No, I think every one of those things I just said, I was giving you the previous version where it was true, and now I believe the exact opposite. Ah. So for a long time I said, I want a dog. And now I do not want a dog. For a long time, I said, I want to travel. Now I do not want to travel. Granted, as you can hear in some of these, there's a common thread is a lot of these are recent 2020 changes, you know, like (laughs) travel and living in a big multicultural city was a lot more appealing five months ago. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now it's not. And so five months ago, I would have said that those are two very, very essential things. I'd very much uh, value those. Those are the top of my list of important things. Um, now I'm like, mm, kind of tore it apart, picked it apart and said, do I really want it? Even travel. Um, I've kind of ripped that one apart. I used to think that I really wanted to get on a plane and go to places. And now I'm thinking that not just because of Corona, um, that I think actually what I want to do is learn about places. And I think that physically getting on a plane and visiting can be a bit of a, a red herring or a placebo in itself that makes you think that you've understood this place because you've walked around and you know, smelled it. But um, maybe actually having one-on-one conversations with people from that place and watching the top five films from that place and reading four books about that place and learning some of the language, you might spend the same number of hours doing that 
as you would walking around the marketplace and looking at the place. And you'd learn much more from the former than the latter. So yeah, each one of those things I said, um, I, I feel like I, I feel the opposite now, you know? So mm -hmm. up until recently, I thought that it was really important or I really loved having smart and famous friends. Ooh. Um, and then just recently realized that no, to me, that's, I like having smart and famous acquaintances. I like having smart and famous uh, conversationalists, but friends is a different category. That's about emotional trust and emotional intimacy. And I just realized recently that no, f true friendship is, it's almost purely emotional. I don't care what somebody's achieved in their life or how book smart they are. It's all about like your emotional trust with somebody. That what, That's what makes a real friendship. The most smart, intellectual, interesting, famous person, if you don't feel an emotional safety with that person, isn't really a friend then. They're an acquaintance. They're a conversationalist. So I don't know. I can, sorry, I'm, I'm diving into each one. You didn't ask me to, but there you no, go. That's right. I, I'm glad I didn't. It, it was nice to hear you talk about it. I'd actually written Smart and Famous because that did fascinate me um, because I've only recently, maybe in the last three years, started to get very famous friends. Um, and actually, I could name three people who are very famous in this country, and I really like them. I really like them more than people I've held for many years as friends. So I've had almost yeah. an opposite view. Well, um, yeah, I I find that a lot too sometimes is that you – I feel like it's a truism that I started rejecting uh, a while back that are your old friends are your best friends because often mm -hmm. I find that I was – changing so often and moving so often that I had almost nothing in common with my old friends anymore. Whereas yeah. my new friends, the one that I'm meeting in my new situation, well, this is, this is the current me. This is, mm. I can relate more to the new friends I've made than the old friends. Um, See, so yeah, I get that. Mm. And then the travel thing. So I've never really been into travel. Just be really quick, Derek, because this is obviously not about me, but it is an idea I'd like to chuck by you because I think the way you think you might be able to, wrap your head around it but do you know what for years when i lived in peterborough everyone used to talk about leaving the place like there was something wrong with the place like life's going to be better when you leave but then they go to australia or they go to london or they go to wherever and then they're always traveling moving away mm -hmm. from place to place, to place and i always thought why don't you if you you know be happy in peterborough first mm -hmm. and then maybe you could be happy in london or sydney but the fantasy that London or Sydney or another city with all of its culture and cosmopolitan and, and art and music scene and whatever else, well, maybe you haven't seen what your own city has got. Mm -hmm. Now, I was always, I felt tied here, Derek, but not restricted. I felt tied here because I did not want to go away and come back in 10 years and my dad has gone. Mm -hmm. I did not want that. I wanted to, if I do any of that stuff, it's after my dad has gone because, you know, I've still got him, but he's he's been pretty ill and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a fighter. And, you know, we've been here 17 years and, and I love it here. Like I could never, I could never leave it. I love my house. I love him in the middle of everything. And these two hour walks we were talking about before the recording went on. And I found all these, these places and routes in Peterborough I never knew existed. Some beautiful places. The river that I've never seen. Walked down the whole river. <laughs> never seen it. Yeah. And isn't it fascinating how we can live somewhere, not see it, and always want to be somewhere else, but we can't see what's beautiful about where we are. That's something I've come to, to be true recently. I think a lot of people's travel desire is to try on being different versions of themselves. I think we all have different aspects in our personality, different selves inside ourself. And so I think people want to see, like, could I be a New Yorker? Let me go to New York and see how I feel in New York. Let's, let's let the, the New York side of my personality come out and see how that feels. Mm, not so much. I think I'm going to go uh, live in the Australian outback for a year and see how that uh, <laughs> crocodile hunter side yeah. of myself uh, comes out, you know. Uh, okay, not so much. Well, what if I were to live in Paris and be oh so continental? You know, whatever it may be, I think people want to, they want to try on these different aspects of their personality. And sometimes 
it really does click, you know, like somebody from the middle of Iowa might visit Italy and go, oh, this is the real me. Actually, I'm speak- I'm thinking of a specific person I know really well. And one of my old best friends uh, at the age of 19 went from the middle of America to Italy and just like never came back. She's like, ah, this, this is where I was meant to be. And she's just been in Italy ever since. She's just fluent in Italian. She hasn't been to America in 20 years. And it's like, that's, that was her place. She needed to make that switch. And this now feels like the real her. Um, God, I left America 10 years ago and I hope to never go back. It doesn't feel like my place anymore. Um, But yeah, I could see that it could also be the fact that like somebody bounces around the world and then finally comes back home and appreciates what they left. A lot of New Zealanders do that actually. A lot of New Zealanders, you know, New Zealand's like paradise, right? Where it's like you grow up in paradise and then at the age of 20, they just have to get out. They have to just go see the rest of the world because it's this isolated island in the Pacific. Um, So they go out, they go into the rest of the world. They actually call it OE in New Zealand, which stands for overseas experience. Everybody calls it, you know, go do your OE. And then at the age of 30, they come back to have kids and then they just stay. So it ends up just being this like little journey that you make to go know yourself a little better and maybe, maybe make you appreciate home even more. So you already appreciated Peterborough, but a lot of people don't appreciate their home until they've gone away and realize, oh, relative to these glorified places, it's actually more awesome, you know? Something that's still fascinating me, Derek, is your five years now podcasts, had a look on your What I'm Doing Now website recently, and it said you were spending about one to three hours a day doing people's podcasts, and now I'm your penultimate podcast, and then there's going to be one more, and then there's no podcast again. I don't know why I've come back to this question three times. It, <laughs> it is fascinating me. Um, so when you were in the flow of podcasting and doing you know, quite a lot of interviews, why were you doing them and what were you getting out of them? Um, at first, I didn't know. At first, I just literally had a list of like 180 people who had asked me to be on their podcast and I would say no to every single one. And then I just put a little tick in my database next to this person saying, here's somebody who wants to interview me. And as that list kept growing, it was, you know, a few times a week I was saying no. So I just thought, all right, it's been five years. Maybe I should start to do this now. Um, But I didn't really know why. I mean, you can tell I'm not here promoting anything. Um, But as I've gotten into it i think that the questions that you ask me are great writing prompts um yeah the the kinds of things that you you asked me by email the kind of things that other people ask me i dig into them a lot and sometimes i accidentally spend like five hours preparing questions which, which i mean preparing answers which doesn't mean word for word answers i mean just thinking through this subject like somebody yesterday said what is your definition of success and i went huh i never thought about that what is my definition of success and i literally sat there for like two hours writing on that subject what is my definition of success and best thing i came up with is success is whatever makes you feel proud that's it but it took me two hours to get there. Uh, so they've been great writing prompts that have made me think of things. So that's why I, I think I will continue doing them. But right now I just need to take a little break because my third book is unfinished and some other programming I'm doing is unfinished because I'm spending hours a day doing this stuff and not doing <laughs> that. So I just need to uh, you know, get my priorities straight again for a bit and I will continue doing these again. Mm. Something I personally believe people get a lot wrong is the definition of happiness. Mm, How so? Because I feel like people are looking for happiness to be contentment. And there's a lot about doing less and minimalism. And I feel like that is against human nature of evolution and striving for growth and progress. Right. And I have this paradox going on, and I, 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 sorry, I hadn't sent it to you before, Derek, to prepare, but it, I'm still wrestling with it. But so many people are like, I just want my kids to be happy. 
I, I think that's one of the worst ways to ways to raise your kids, personally. Um, because how are they going to be uh, independent if they don't go through challenge? Right. Are they going to be disciplined if that you don't actually put them through stuff they don't like? Um, how are they going to get a sense of growth and achievement? I'm not saying they have to be superstars. Um, so I don't, I don't feel like the goal in raising the kids is for them to be happy. I feel like the goal in raising kids is to show them what the, the world is really like for when they go into it. Mm. By the way, I'm no parenting expert. I'm trying to, I'm, mm. I think about this a lot and I'm talking it out to you, Derek, but um, I can honestly say my greatest sense of happiness is virtually immediately after one of my worst experiences in my life. I.e., when things are the hardest, the worst, you know, the, I'm in my most pain, I'm the most challenged. And then when you either, Overcome it, succumb it, get rid of it. That feeling of this feels amazing. Of what I, I when I broke the the um, world record for the longest public speech, I just did that thinking, well, I can talk. But it, 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 it nearly killed me, and my voice went, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and afterwards, I felt such elation, and I thought, for everyone who just thinks happiness is contentment, you're missing this. You're missing what we're supposed to do as human beings, which is to strive and to grow and to evolve and, you know, and, and I just think there's so much out there about happiness is contentment and being, and I can't buy it. I can't get my head around it. And, and I, I, it's a paradox. And what are your thoughts on it, Derek? What is happiness? Deep happy versus shallow happy. And you just described it perfectly. That, I like the way that, to me, shallow happy is what you call contentment. Deep happy is what you describe as after your long speech. Um, and I love the fact that I have been teaching my kid about this since he was like two or three years old. And just, you know, like, just he's only been talking for a year. And I say, well, you know, that's deep happy versus shallow happy. And he's like, deep happy versus shallow happy. What does that mean? <laughs> and I was just like, well... Shallow happy is when you just eat the ice cream. And I said, deep happy is when you invent your own flavor of ice cream and you give ice cream to everybody in your neighborhood and it makes you really happy. I said, that's deep happy. And he, and he said, but I don't like ice cream. I said, okay, well, let me think of another example. Um, and I said, deep happy is when you do something difficult you set out to do something difficult and then you do it and you're really, really deeply happy because you've, you've done something difficult. You're really proud of yourself. And that one he got. Um, and, uh, and I said that what's a little sad to me is that a lot of people just focus on being shallow happy and they don't know how good it feels to be deep happy. So a lot of people just eat the ice cream and they just watch TV and they don't know deep happy. And in, what's amazing is that even at like two years old, like he kind of got it. And I kind of forgot about it, right? But then a month later, he came to me and said, hey dad, uh, a new kid came to our school today and I told him about deep happy versus shallow happy. <laughs> I was like, yes, he remembered. <laughs> and I said, what did you tell him? And, and he kind of echoed it back to me. He said, I told him that anybody can be shallow happy, that's easy. That's just doing something fun, but deep happy is when you do something difficult and, and then you do it, you would, you finish it. And I was like, Oh, that was so nice to hear. So anyway, I, I think about that a lot that, um, Ooh, I heard a, a, another nice way to put it. It's what you want now versus what you want most. That one really stuck with me. I can't remember what random book I read that from, but what I want now versus what I want most. So to me, shallow happy is just doing what I want now. Deep happy is doing what I want most. Mm. So yeah, that's my take on it. So what I love talking to you, why I love talking to you in these 90 minutes we've had, Derek, and when I listen to your podcast and followed some of your stuff is you always find a way of saying things with the story and analogy or in a more articulate way than is rattling in my brain. Um, <laughs> So I'm very privileged to be your penultimate podcast for a long while. <laughs> I feel sad and I hope that maybe one day we may do this again or so our paths may cross in some way. Yeah. Um, 
I know you said you don't come on this podcast for, for promotion, but I really would love for people to be able to get your book and be able to follow you where you want them to follow you, if you want them to follow you. And totally respect if you don't want to give your email address. <laughs> no, but, nobody uh, follow me. Get away well, from I'm me. Not, <laughs> I'm not as big as Tim, so you won't have that same problem. Um, but but you're you know the, you've done two books, have you already? Yeah, uh, I guess I've I've written three. I'm writing my fourth, but um, one is out there today. Depending on when this hits the air, my next two might be out. So yeah, it's my my book in 2011. I did for Seth Godin was called Anything You Want. Um, that one's very out there. My next book coming out is for musicians, and it's called Your Music and People. But for example, that like speed punk country metal, you know, hey motherfucker, you know, um, that was a story from that book, from Your Music and People, which um, a friend of mine uh, that's a real marketer guy, he said, man, you know, you're saying that this is a book for musicians, but dude, this is a book about marketing and positioning. And I was like, uh -huh. if you want it, if you can read it metaphorically, that's great. Go for it. Because, you know, there's some people who know how to read metaphorically, you know, they can read a book like The Inner Game of Tennis and apply tennis lessons to their life, right? Mm. So you might find your music and people interesting, even if you're not a musician, if mm. you can read metaphorically. And then my next one after that is called Hell Yeah or No, which is really just a collection of my best articles from 10 years. Mm. And then my third book uh, that I'm still writing right now, I'm so damn excited about, is called uh, How to Live. And uh, yeah, I'm not done writing it, so we don't need to talk about that. But those are my books. And if you go to sivers.org, S-I-V-E-R-S.org, that is me. Everything I do is there. And um, yeah, just follow me there. I, it, actually, my email address is still widely out in the public, you know, as you can, there's a contact page with my email address in a big font. So yes, please send me an email and introduce yourself because that is one of my favorite parts. Derek, I'd love to stay and talk all day. Uh, I'm really grateful to you. I've really enjoyed this. It was everything I had hoped it to be and a little <laughs> bit more. I uh, feel challenged. <laughs> Um, thank you. Very grateful. Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.